Disney princess. Right? <laughs> That's my favorite riff right now. I sing it all. I'm like, oh yeah, I love that riff. Yeah. Well, the, the people, if you want to ask questions, step on up. The microphone's right over there. Yeah, if you want to talk on. to her, what ask her a question know? about what she does. What do you want to know? Random. Feel free to line up here. Maybe an odd question, but if you were to play Mass Effect, what major decision would you make? <laughs> <laughs> I would experiment. I'd try all of them, honestly. I played Paragon, but with Renegade whenever I felt like it. And I would check out, you know, integration because I want to know. And because I think it's a metaphor for our world. Like right now we have so much conflict because everyone's polarizing. You know, everyone's going, well, you and me, and, and there's no meeting of the minds. There's no like, okay, let's, let's back up until we find something we both agree on. And let's start there, because we are the same. You know, I'd want to check it out for that reason. Yeah. As, far as, yeah. as far as playing uh, Sarah Palmer, she's kind of more of an abrasive character. <laughs> and you just don't seem like that kind of person. Now. Where do you go to dig up that, um, that take charge, I'm the head honcho kind of attitude? Take the piss out of everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, for me, all roles come out of the writing. I think writers are amazing and they should be the stars of the world because without them, <laughs> someone has to start it, and that's writers, you know? And they, it's a, an incredible thing they do. So for me, all roles come out of the writing, and I, we all have all of that in us, don't you? That's why you like that character. You're like, oh yeah, I'd say that, you know? But you're polite because you've been conditioned. So in acting, we're allowed to remove all of our conditioning and pull out those pieces of us that suit the character. And I like to disappear myself. I don't exist, you know? I just step into whatever is in the role and I just allow it to happen, you know? And it, it's been a lot, you know, it's a lifelong process of releasing all those like social inhibitions. Oh, I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that and just look like this. And you really have to let go of what you look like. I'm like, I don't know, it's not me, I don't know. So I don't watch many of my performances. I'm like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. As long as you're happy, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, so I know that you played Miss Marvel, who's one of my favorite superheroes, and I was just wondering who your favorite superhero was. Mm. Right now it's Wonder Woman. Yeah. <laughs> With 75 other women, we uh, Julie Nathanson, who is a, a beautiful talent and a divine human being, uh, organized um, a group of us on Twitter to she just put out a, a message, and it grew to 75 of us. You know, voice actresses, writers, producers, directors, casting people, production people, and I think there were three dudes there and 72 women. It was insane. It was incredible. Yeah. It was great. Wonder Woman. Yeah. Well, now you've done so many different styles of, of voice acting, not just, you know, the take charge women and, and characters, you know, goofy stuff. You were on, when you were on the regular show, you did, you've done all kinds of... Is there any that you prefer, the kick-ass women, perhaps? Uh, you know, my favorite thing is the variety. Mm -hmm. I prefer to do not what people are expecting of me. I like to just be, you know, out there, out there, out there. I love my crazy sort of Princess Morbuck style roles. I love my, you know, um, I love the villains too because they're operating on such a bizarre set of morality. You know, everyone thinks they're doing the right thing, including bad guys. I'm like, no, I'm right. Mm -hmm. That's, you're all wrong. <laughs> That's where they operate from. Yeah, I like the unexpected. Who's next? Well, how do you I'm not your favorite voice. I was wondering, what was your favorite character to play? That's like saying, who's your favorite child? Well, we all know that everyone has their favorite child. No. <laughs> there are some that have certain special connections, yes. I mean, I love the fact that we broke the glass ceiling with Shepard. Um, that's thanks to you guys. I love, yeah. Um, I love that I get to be Cinderella. Um, I love that I'm backup Dory for Ellen, that's really fun. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So you're also a ride at Disneyland? I am a ride at Disneyland. <laughs> and I'm an ice show and I'm a bunch of toys. <laughs> it's really crazy. Um, yeah, what are they calling up and say, can you do an Ellen DeGeneres voice? No, 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 they're like, we need someone for Dory. They did a big search, a national search. It's extraordinarily difficult. That's a, she's a really 
fell sort of in love with Ellen as a person learning Dory, because there's not a mean bone in that character's body, and that means that there's not a mean bone in Ellen's body. She's extraordinary. Her kindness and her genius and her spontaneity. You know, I am absolutely second banana on that one. She's first banana, but she's so busy. I'm happy to be the backup. So it's with her blessing. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I would assume so. Oh my gosh, I hope so. If no, if not, I would do it. Um, yeah, that's really fun. And I love, um, yeah, sorry, the question was favorite. Oh, I love my crazy stuff too. You know, the Princess Morbucks and the, and the wacky. I was just lost our sound, guys. I was just wondering who was your favorite uh, romance option in Mass Effect, and, and do you know anything about the new Carmen San Diego reboot? I don't, but if you guys want me in it, you should definitely contact them. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome you to email them because they, you know people listen sometimes. Um, I would love to do the new Carmen San Diego in any capacity. Uh, and as far as that goes, you know, I always say about the romances in Mass Effect, don't make me pick. I will say that I loved the, um, the groundbreakingness of the Liara option so much. And I loved the, um, something really special about the writing, especially toward the end for Garrus. And some of the fame writing was just extraordinary. I mean, all the writing was extraordinary, but that we sort of hit this other beautiful level in some of that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're a mantis in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, I am. The cartoon. Mm -hmm. when, when you're asked to do that, do, did they ask for like a, a direct impression of the movie character, or was it different? I haven't had a chance to see it yet. No, no. We just uh, went off of the genius of the team. I was like, what do you guys need? And they're like this. I'm like, okay. And they're like, no, move it this way. I'm like, okay. So there's always a few minutes when you do a session, the first character for the first time, you go in and you sort of listen to what their description is, you throw out ideas, they come back at you like, no, higher pitch, lower pitch, uh, more texture, less texture, this attitude, that feel, and we came up with that, I believe, you know, that whole vibe to her, and it was really fun. Yeah. Now you're not a, much of a gamer, are you? I suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I spend so much time doing that that I've never had time to sit down and learn how it would be, it would take so much time, I would have time to do nothing else. And I need to go do something else. When I'm not working, I want to be outside. I want to go have a life that I can then bring into games, an actual, like, you know, adventures. I like to be outside, I like to travel, I like to go back from Australia, and, you know, I, I love, I love to, yeah, I'm an outside junkie. But you realize that people in this room would pay great Loads of money to, uh, to, to watch you play as Commander Shepard. <laughs> you know, there, there are these YouTube gamers, you know, and they, they watch people playing video games. And That's a trip. I would be so game. frustrating and awful to watch. They'd be like, what is it? Oh, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, there it is again. Subscribers are dropping. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it, it, would, it would be literally that. And you're like, oh. I did a, a Twitch broadcast. Um, with Chloe Dykstra about, you know, a few weeks ago. And uh, I remember there was a game and I don't play, so I was telling them how to play for me. And about 30 minutes in, I'm in a cold sweat. I seriously thought I had food poisoning. I was like, wow, can I make it to the end of this broadcast? I was like, yeah, I can. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. And I'm literally in a cold sweat. I'm like, I'm gonna curl right on his head. I was like, wow, this is not good. And I said, man, you guys, I think I gotta take a break. I don't know what I ate for breakfast, but I think I got food poisoning. And Jess V pipes up from behind me. She goes, no, she goes, that happens to me too. It's the screen. And I was like, seriously? Because I get motion sick at the drop of a hat. It's my, it's my Achilles heel, but I've learned to, sorry people, I've learned to puke and go on. You know, I have the worst, I have the most insane puking stories ever. I'm not kidding you, I have, what? Well, it's pretty bad. You just ate. Are you sure you want to hear it? <laughs> so I'm in this little plane. My father, my our third cousin, built a little tiny plane, and you know we don't we don't have a lot. And uh, this is years ago. And my father's flying, and we're going from one part of Labrador to another. And he decides to take the scenic route for the last 10 minutes, and it's 27 below on the ground. We're going about I don't know, you know, airspeed for a tiny plane, and it's very bouncy. 
and I have a ski mask on because I'm really cold, and it's it's small. I mean, it's like maybe two of these chairs squished next to each other slept, is the size of the entire inside of the plane. So there's no going anywhere. There's no plastic bag, and I feel it coming. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, and I, can I hold it back? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. No, I can't. I just throw up, and I keep my mouth shut. There's nowhere to go. So I swallow it. Twice. Sorry, I'm accustomed to motion sickness, so this was like, I was like, wow, this is tough. And just me, so I spent the entire rest of the broadcast sort of staring at the bottom of the screen going, yeah, this is great, looking at the corners. I wouldn't look directly at the screen again. And I was like, nope. And sure enough, the cold sweat subsided and I could hang out. So yeah, I like to pick my, my puke battles. <laughs> Sorry. You asked for it. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I, I've since learned to actually you can train yourself out of motion sickness. And I was on a, a boat in uh, Hawaii, and it was the night. I don't know if any of you know the volcano burst through uh, to the ocean last year. And I was lucky enough to be there um, at that time. And my son also gets very motion sick. And we it took a night boat out there. And we were great until we stopped. And you're bobbing around in the water. I'm like, oh, here comes. And I thought, not this time. Not this time. And so I'm staring at the water, and I'm ripping my stomach as tight as I can, because I heard you can train yourself out of it. I'm like, I'm training myself out of it. And we're, we're boating back to the, you know, the shore, and I'm like, oh. And I feel this thing on my hand, and my son was asleep on my lap. I'm like, is he licking my hand? What is he doing? <laughs> he had thrown up in his sleep. That's how much sick he gets. I was like, oh, God. And I'm like, I will not puke, I will not puke. And my husband looks at me like, and I'm like, don't talk. I'm <laughs> talking, I'm not talking right now. And I just glared at the horizon and gripped my stomach like this for the entire like hour ride, 45 minutes, about like three hour ride back. And I was like, mm. and I made it to shore without puking. I was dizzy for two hours. But I, thank you. That's how I felt. That's how I felt. And I swear the next time I drove my, I could sing driving. I drove myself around curvy things. So I was like, I think it's slightly better, and even if it's not, I'm going to tell myself it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well. <laughs> Any other questions? I was going to grit and puke. I was going to talk about the voice acting industry. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. That might be a little more palatable. <laughs> <laughs> Just you, you have been, you've been doing this for so long. How has the industry changed? Oh. I, I get the feeling that voice actors are a lot more respected than they used to be. <laughs> you know what, I think they're more recognized by fans, but they're absolutely not more recognized by the, by the industry. industry. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been on strike. We voice actors in gaming have been on strike since, I mean, it's been a while now. And what we're striking over is that we wanted four things in our contract. We wanted um, uh, a stunt person to be present on set in mocap shoots, but they're not, and people get seriously hurt. And we wanted vocal protection for when we shred our voices, because I have friends who've not been able to work for months because they shredded their voices. We wanted a second payment if a game makes over, sells over two million units. Just a second session, like it's like 900 mm -hmm. bucks and then a little more on the great, great big ones. That's what we wanted. And we wanted, what was the other thing? Oh God, such a bad member. One other thing. And um, the, oh, and transparency. So, because. I might audition for a game, or my agent might negotiate for a game that's part of a massive franchise, and it's called Peanuts, because everything's done under a code name. We don't know that. If it's a big, multi-multi-million dollar game, we're still paid scale, because they're like, oh, we can't afford it. But suddenly you've got six figures for a celebrity, and you can't afford to pay me an extra $800? That's crap. And so we went into negotiations with them, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and we, we came up with a contract that was like, look, we finally said, they, were, they budged on nothing. Nothing. And they, and yeah, what we asked for was the, the bonus if the game is really successful. And one executive said to one of our people, I'm not giving them a bonus, that comes out of my bonus. And uh, yeah, yeah. So um, we finally in the end said, look, okay, we've got our version of the contract that has the stuff we need in it, those four things. How about we do this? For every project that comes across the union's desk, we offer the employer, the company making the game, the option to use your version of the contract, you corporate 11 people, or our version of the contract. 
just let us just show it to them and they get to pick. That means that you never ever have to use the contract you don't like. And they said, no. So we went on strike. And now they're talking about, they're trying to take our, those beautiful AAA titles over to England and Canada and make them instead. So we need you guys to reach out and say, hey, we want our games with our people made here. And please suck it up on your own bonuses and be fair. Or at least you don't even have to do it under that. You know, just do the right thing. So you guys matter. If you could speak up, that would be massively helpful. Yeah, thank you. Some time ago, the cast of The Simpsons, mm -hmm. they all went on strike. Yeah. And they were going to, the guys were going to continue to make the cartoons and just recast the voices. Yeah, the casting call went out, I did not go. Yeah. 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 So, maybe I was wrong. I, I was under the impression that the voice actors is treated much better. No. He said. By the fans, yes, by the corporation. Well, let me rephrase that. Who we're on strike against are 11 corporations. You know, my understanding of the statistics is they used to make about 40 games a year, now they're making about 10. So it's not that many games, but they are big titles that do have meaning for a lot of our members on many levels. You know, it's money, it's also the, the value of the game, and um, what we've done is gone out and connected with a ton of what we call indie developers, whose budgets are anywhere from nothing to, you know, a million, five, seven, eight, nine million. And we've, got, we've actually got 45 brand new games in production from that. We've got 30 some people signed to the brand new contract, which is awesome. So we've kind of gone out and gone, you guys don't want to come to our party. We're still having a party, who wants to come? And all these fabulous indies have come. And they have, they get it. They get more that the fans really care. That it matters, to, I mean, does it matter to you guys who voices your games? Yes. <laughs> So let them know because they do listen. What's, what's the best way to contact a gaming company about this? You know, I, that's not, it's a great question. I think these, I think speaking up on places like Reddit and Twitter and emailing directly and creating little mini campaigns if everybody got, you know, if everybody got like, you know, their gaming buddies to all email and it takes five minutes, it would make such a difference and if you did it a couple times, that's a decent amount of volume. You know, it's like writing to your senator, no one does it. But, so when you do it, it's like, oh wow, what's this? You know, and you get the complaints, and then it creates a kind of a momentum which would be invaluable for us. And maybe like writing a senator, it would be better to do it on paper. It's entirely to. possible, although the gaming, that's a great idea. Also, the gaming community is so powerful online, and online is what they measure. And unlike the senators, they pay attention to online. The senators are actually not required to read any email. They are required to open every letter and listen to every and register every phone call. Okay. So don't email your senators, call and write them, but email the game company. <laughs> With all of them. With well, the corporate 11, oh God, I mean, you know, we're talking EA, Activision, those guys. Mm -hmm. ones. All the usual suspects. Yeah. What's your question? Hello, Jennifer. My name's Charles. Hi, Charles. Off the get-go, when you're looking at the idea of U.S. versus Canada, mm -hmm. when it comes to games, animation, and the movie industry, obviously a lot of the AAA stuff, a lot of that's done out of the L.A. U.S. area, mm -hmm. yet the amount of television and animation that comes out of Canada in mm -hmm. retrospect, so what's, what's the difference as far as almost just like the politics and the feeling between those two games? It's interesting. There's a... It's a complex question, because if it's being done in Canada to escape U.S. accountability, that's not good. If it's being done in Canada because Canada's just the better place to do it, because the, the like I've shot, you know, I shot a movie in Canada, I've done some game stuff in Canada, um, you know, I've got The Long Dark is a Canadian-generated game, it's a Canadian product, and that's a fantastic, you know, that's a big fat thumbs up, because it's a Canadian production. You know, um, Wolves, which was David Hayter's movie, was shot up there um, because it, the Canadian system really supported it well. You know, the money was there, the opportunity was there, the, the I'm sure there are probably, I'm not privy to it, but I know there's production incentives up there that make it attractive, and David's a dual citizen, you know, I am as well. So, um, yeah, there's, when you're, there's a spectrum. You know, when you're escaping, the, doing the right thing, going to Canada, that sucks. When you're doing it because you're Canadian, you're generating it yourself, there's a lot of really awesome stuff that's generated. 
And then sometimes it's just a co-venture. And then that, that's really good too. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, accents. Every voice actor is called upon to do accents. Where do you do your research? Uh, I love YouTube videos of drunk people. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It depends on the format. I mean, if you're doing a game and you're supposed to be really serious, then I go to like NPR or, you know, uh, documentaries where the locals are speaking. Um, if it's a Cartoon Network or something, I'm looking for the YouTube drama people because they're over the top. I'm like, ah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, oh yeah, that's great. I'm totally doing that. <laughs> but NPR, things like that, documentaries. Who's that? Who have you been most starstruck by? Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I haven't met her yet. Um, probably Edward James almost. Yeah. Yeah. For a minute. And it's weird because I don't like doing that to people because it's it's pressure. You know, you have to be on. And um, and it's appreciated so much, I know, but because that's how I feel. But we met, uh, we were actually both at a con and he was watching the World Cup and um, I just, I thought about, um, also, you know what, Travis Fimmel, I love his work, and I met him at a kid's birthday party, and I was like, oh my god. For me, I had to, for both of those people, I had to figure out how to acknowledge their work without putting them on the spot, and, I, for, and it really is about their work. I don't know them as people. I have no idea who they are as people. Actually, I do now. They're both really, really cool people, um, but I, um, I, I acknowledge their work. And I, was, and I told them specifically what it was about their work I found groundbreaking and moving. And then I left it alone. I was like, that was awesome. And now, how's the work up? <laughs> you know, how's the World Cup? And it was fun. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. And then where James almost, when he says your name, that's what's, because we did, he was, he was at Salt Lake Comic Con a few years back, and I moderated the panel, and he shakes your hand. Hello, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> wow, right here. <laughs> he's, an, he's a very, very, very intelligent man. And he's, and he's an activist. And that is my favorite part of him. He yeah. opened the rabbit hole for me. And at first I was thinking, wow, this is kind of wacky. I'm not sure about this. And then I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm, I'm wacky too. Because it really completely makes sense. Yeah. Who's next? Uh, in the last panel, it was Steve Braun. Someone can give me an unexpected answer. And I want to give you the same question. Uh, they asked me, out of all those games that he voiced, how many did he play? He said he played two. <laughs> And in your experience with all of these different voice actors in the game, how many are actually gamers, or do they just roll and not that? That's a really good question. I, I think in the gaming community, more and more, you know, as time's got on, because I've been in since the beginning, <laughs> relatively, not, not, I'm not like Charles Martinet, not the beginning, but I'm the sort of phase two, maybe? Um, 94, whatever that qualifies as. Um, Back, you know, the crew of us that started in 94, we're not as, you know, 95 in the 90s, we're not as much gamers, I'd say maybe half of us, a third of us, a quarter of us, but a lot of the people who grew up gaming are now voice acting in the community and they are fans and players. It's shifting and changing. I'm like, oh wow, you, oh, you really play your, wow, that's cool. I just sit and watch the YouTube cinematics of my friends. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. That's how that works. This is the part where I was acting. Yeah, the part, oh, I wish I'd done that different. Because we actually, I don't know if people know this, we mentioned it yesterday in the voice actor panel. Everything's cold reading. Um, it's about 5% of the time that we get the script ahead of time. Is that you? Yeah. Just to pop it right yeah, pretty much. You pop it in front of me and go. Like you could hand me something right now and I would be like, all right, let me do this. And um, so what you're hearing in the games is. Sometimes it's either from anything from take one for me to maybe take at the most take four. I sometimes go into you know if it's a slower project we can do six or seven takes. But that's the most. Um, it's it's like okay here you go, make it make sense, make it work. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me though. I mean it's because you haven't learned how. It's a skill. <laughs> it's, it, it, and you would yeah. like you're a smart man. You've got skills. And if we put you in that context for a couple hours, and you'd be like, ah, okay. And then it just starts to, it's like playing tennis. You're like, okay, okay. serving. You know, what? What? I don't think as a writer and, and as a director, I want my actors to at least have familiarity. I mean, and about 5% of the time we get to. But what, instead, what we get is we get a briefing either from the voice director or the writer or producer. Like, here's the storyline, here's the arc, here's you are, who you are in it. 
and go. But I mean, the workload on those things, I mean, the script for an animated show is what, you know, 32 pages? Yeah. And when I measure game scripts in phone book size. A small one is a phone book. So okay, that's a long time. It's, it's a, and, and my part of the thing, I always say I'm the tip of the pen. I'm the ink in the tip of the pen. There's a, like proportionally, there's a whole lot of work going on that isn't me that makes that actually happen. It's a massive workload that these guys have to deal with in trouble. Yeah, it's crazy. Amazing. Who's next? I was wondering for how you're voice acting for games, have you ever played any of the games that you've been voice acting for? I was made to play Mass Effect 2 once for an hour by the brilliant and oh, amazing Tom Bissell. He's a writer. He was writing for The New Yorker. He's writing a piece and on me, and he made me play Mass Effect 2 for an hour. And I just want to go back and re-record it now that I understood even more, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you mentioned not reading cold. What does what it be your voice actor coaches will prep you for, like emotional prep and things like that? How do you feel? I never prep feeling. I, that's a very common um, thing people think about, but I never, ever, ever approach a script in terms of how to say a line. I always approach it in terms of what. What am I trying to accomplish? One of my favorite acting teachers ever was this beautiful man, Jeff Corey. He was very scary, very tall sci-fi actor, and he was amazing. Um, I remember doing, I was in my early 20s, doing a little workshop with him in Atlanta, and somebody was upstage, on stage emoting their face off. And as a 20-something, I was like, that's amazing. You know? And Jeff was like, stop! Uh-oh. And pardon me, I'm going to swear. Forgive me. I'm just quoting Jeff. And he goes, damn it, people! He goes, real human beings don't set out to feel. They set out to do things. And in the course of doing, they have feelings they don't want to have. I don't want to see your emotion. But the trick is, you have to have it. Because real people, you all feel all the time, and you cover it. So you have to get those layers in. So when you see a performance, you're like, whoa, wow. Wow, it's just not working for you. It's because they're, 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 they're displaying their insides all over the place. They forgot the skin. Everyone has a skin. And that's just another level of your character development. So you're getting an acting lesson today, too. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So Who's expanding that? on that, based on how you felt inside playing <laughs> Shepard and Palmer, yeah. who do you think would win in a fight? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. That's, That's a, a tough question. question. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I love Palmer's irreverence, I have to say. You know, Palmer hasn't been through as much as Shepard. That's, that's one of the key, key things there. Key character things. Yeah, there's pieces of yourself that you put on and take off the shelf when you play a character. And, you know, Palmer's got the... I don't know, just get the room to be irreverent and in your face. And yeah, Shepard does as much. Who's next? Um, I'm a huge fan of your work, and mm -hmm. I guess I was just curious, because it seemed really different, was your experience with the Metroid Prime series, yeah. and how that voice acting, how that goes. It seems different from everything else. Mm. He was all grunting. He was all grunting. I did the first one, and then for some weird reason, I didn't come back in for the subsequent ones. They, they didn't ask. I suspect they might have gone on Union or a different route or something. I, I don't mind it a bit, but um, I'm here anytime. I would love to come back. Love to come back. Um, yeah, it was a lot of grunting. When I first started in animation back in um, way back in '93, I made my my demo tape at the time we used tapes, and. Um, the one thing I knew that I could do that I didn't know that other women could necessarily do was action. So the first 10, 15 seconds, which is a long time on demo reel, of my demo reel was nothing but action sounds. <laughs> you know, all that stuff for 10, 15 seconds. And it was like, wow, who is this? Maybe it was only five seconds if it felt like a <laughs> Yeah. Who's next? Uh, so I grew up playing actually the older world like. Oh yeah, hello. Star Wars is a huge part of my life because of that game. Uh, I'm curious if uh, Star Wars was part of your life before working on Star Wars. It was part of my life in that it was part of the culture. You know, I was a kid. I was an extreme nerd. Like I grew up reading with my dog. I didn't really have a lot of friends as a kid. I was I was very ostracized. I was like the kid everyone made fun of. That was just where it landed. You know, and the beauty of that is the strength and character that it gave me later in life. I think I have. Someone asked me, I was like, yeah, no, I had one friend when I lived there, and I had one friend when I lived there. So I didn't even do anything. I just like, how 
dolled up and read books. Don't hurt me. I'm going to go in the woods and read books. Yeah. Hello. Uh, one of my uh, hopes at some point is that someday we can see an Avatar Kiyoshi prequel series. Yes, please. Yes. Write an email about that. <laughs> You've got a lot of homework here today. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you have any uh, insights into working on that character or that character itself. I I'd just love to hear any sort of uh, pick your brain. You know, so much of that character comes out of the genius of uh, the director, Andrea Romano, and that oh, gosh, oh, gosh, really just amazing. Um, and and those writers, and yeah, that's really where the source of the genius is. I am I am probably the last person to ask, but I have to say she's one of my favorite characters. To play. I love her so much. I love the combination of Zen and Don't Mess with Me. <laughs> So the work is done on your own in the booth. Yeah. How awkward is it when you meet the other actors that you've had a romantic relationship with? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not at all because, you know, re voice recording sessions typically are, um, in, in that part of the business, are about four or four hours. And when you're doing an animated series, it's four hours and you're all taking turns. When you're doing a game, it's a four-hour, one-person show, yeah. which is very intense, physically, mentally, all that. I'll come out of there dizzy sometimes, and um, just from the concentration of it. And so when another actor walks in the room, we're like, hi, <laughs> hi, you know? And then meeting them socially, you're like, oh, it's you, yeah. And honestly, I think I mentioned this yesterday, I find the romance things mortifying to do. So I, I literally flushed them from my brain. Like, I, I forget that I did it. I'm like, feel better, <laughs> having forgotten that I did that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tell me where you're from. Yeah, where are you, where are you from? Tell me where you're from. You've been here a while, though. Oh, yes. Yeah, because your accent has mutated. It's not, your R's have mutated, so you almost sound a little Aussie. Did, no, 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 no. You got the beautiful, which is why I was confused. I'm like, he's not Australian. But those R's are very different. So it's like, my husband's a Kiwi, but he's lived in America, so a lot of people think he's an Aussie. He's like, no, I'm not. Calm <laughs> down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, That was some, something else I was going to bring up, is that a lot of voice actors I've met are able to, and you were, that's a perfect example, you're able to tune in. Yeah, you can hear. You know, your appellation. Or, you know. Sometimes I can hear if someone lives with someone from another country, because they, they'll have an affect to their voice, but it's not completely there. I'm like, where are your parents from? That's what it is. You can hear it. She's very specific in her speech. She yeah. gets it from you. Yeah. Interesting. Have you picked up the Utah accent? <laughs> <laughs> it's very sly and difficult to detect. Uh, I haven't found it yet. Well, it's easy. It's very lazy with the way you speak. Uh, and okay. switch the vowels. It's, it's like instead of a glass of milk, it's a glass of milk. And mm milk. -hmm. Ah, good to know. Things like that, we drop our teas sometimes. All the time. Yeah. The town of Leighton is actually Leighton. <laughs> <laughs> well, next to the mountain islands. That is an interesting thing where people are, I just go back from the Aus, what we would say Australia, but everybody in Australia, I can't say it anymore, in Australia goes Australia. Australia. They don't say all, they say Australia. Yeah, Australia. Yeah. Heavy on the right. Yes. How you going? After a while, I was there. I was like, "How you going?" I'm like, expecting me to be American. Hi. And and do you often, when you travel, do you, do you pick up the uh, oh, yeah. and start talking that way? Oh yeah. I do, well, I went to London. Yeah, I Sorry. well, I, I lived in Alabama for 19 years, and I, I, I'm, you know, as you guys know, I'm a money nerd, and I, I have investments in Alabama right now. And um, so whenever I talk to anybody down there, I need to get stuff done. I'm talking like that. And it's involuntary because that's how they talk. So I'm just talking right back to them. And then when I'm on the phone with my sister in Canada, I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. all right, no, that's true. Are you going to have supper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> now, I was told not to ask you about money. Uh, oh, no, ask me about money. <laughs> There's somebody in here who said, don't ask her about money. <laughs> I do. Just give me the stop, 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 and then I'll stop. I don't, I'm not offended because I get so far down the rabbit hole. I see people blaze over. I'm like, when did I lose you 10 minutes ago? <laughs> well, where should I be investing then? In yourself, in your own knowledge. No, I'm serious. 
No, seriously, okay, okay, this is something everybody needs to know, and I didn't get to this in my panel yesterday, I wish I had. Uh, I don't remember the year, if it was the 70s or 80s, forgive me, I think it was the 80s. Pensions used to be what are called defined benefit plans. That is, they defined what you're gonna, what your benefit's gonna be. When you retire, you're gonna get X dollars a month. Okay, great. And then they passed a law, because it benefited all the corporations, because they're honestly, they run everything right now, until we take it back. Um, but now they are defined contributions. What that means is, your employer's gonna go, I'm gonna contribute this much a month to your fund. You manage it, or we'll stick it in ours, where they're gonna pull a bunch of fees out of it, and they're gonna charge you to death, okay? And what you're gonna have in the end is gonna not be that great. But nobody made any provisions to teach you how to grow that money. You are now responsible for growing the money for the end part of your life. The, what used to be 20 years, 15, 20 years, which will now be 30, 40, possibly even 50 years, you're gonna live past employment because we're living longer. No one told you how to do it. And don't take your advice from financial advisors. I respect financial advisors. However, even the best have a vested interest in you moving in a particular direction. They're incentivized for you to invest in certain things. So start reading. Start with Rich Dad Poor Dad by Kiyosaki. Um, and, you know, I'll throw up some books on my art of money thing for you. So. Who's next? Uh, how much live theater have you done, and what was your favorite oh, piece? Oh, man. I, ha I did a lot when I was in high school, because that we were a fine arts high school. That's what we did. I did everything from acting to directing, to which I did not like. To uh, My favorite thing is I was the lighting crew. I love being on And when I played in rock bands, I was, I was the lighting crew because it was me, and I was it. <laughs> and I hung all the lights, and I, I you know, focused all the lights. And one time I went to plug in, I got everything hung, and I went to plug in the main box, and I didn't know it, but I had my finger on the ground. And I was on top of a ladder, and I was like, ah! and I almost got thrown off the ladder. I was like, ah! I will never do that again. Um, yeah, so production-wise, I remember, oh gosh, we had this touring show of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is a little, you know, out, pull out of a Shakespeare play. And I uh, loved doing that because we had so much fun. We went all around and toured that. And I loved, I did one of my early, early things. I think I was 14. I did uh, Man, the Moon, Marigolds. You know, I did that. And I loved that. It was the first time that an actor that I respect came up to me and said, you've got talent. And I was like, really? Well, that's cool. <laughs> what is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool, thanks. Thank you. One more. So I'm also a big fan of Max Hill Republic, and I was wondering what was it like to interact with a character that, that's personality is constricted to lines of dialogue with confused facial expression? It, that was a really interesting experience. That was one of the first times when I played a character who had went dark and light. And I was like, okay, she's what now? Uh, Dara O'Farrell, who was brilliant, and Jenny McSwain, who was directing me. Um, they, I mean, it's really them, the performance is them. They, they just guided me into what to be, and it was amazing. They're, they're incredible. Yeah, it's my first time. It, that was my first time with, okay, I'm, I'm different. Is this okay? Yes, yeah, that's what we want. I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Well, thank you for Ayla Sakura, by the way. Oh, that was my thank you. She's going to be here all the rest of the day, yeah. and her booth is right over here. Yeah. I'll be out from four food. to five, but I'll be back after five. So if you're, if you're too shy to ask a question today, step on. Come on over, come see me. Thanks for coming, you guys. Jennifer Hale. <laughs>